Electrician Apprenticeship Program celebrated the graduation of one of their largest classes yet as they hope to fill the need for the profession in the metro. The grand opening for Omaha's newest concert venues is today coming up. Local reaction. We're tracking severe thunderstorms rolling through Nebraska right now. We'll have the latest on that coming up. Fox 42 News at 9 starts right now. Thank you for being with us tonight. I'm Monty Torres. A lot going on outside weather-wise. Chief Meteorologist Chris Kuiper is here to fill us in. Chris. Lots of thunderstorms across eastern Nebraska this evening. and We've had a tornado watch, an effect for the area, which has just expired. But that doesn't mean we still can't have severe thunderstorms and maybe even a little isolated tornado out there as well at this hour. Let me show you the radar picture across the area. And the thing that stands out to me right away is just uh, the little hole here. First off, we've got all these thunderstorms, which have been severe through most of the afternoon, arcing this, uh, this arc like that except this little gap right around Omaha. It seems like Omaha has kind of been spared the worst of the severe weather. Uh, nevertheless, let's zoom in here a little closer to it and see exactly what we have going on. And just real recently, we've had some activity on the far northwest side of town towards uh, out towards Diamond Head and towards uh, Boys Town. We've had a little thunder, a pretty healthy thunderstorm out in that area earlier on, and now it continues to rotate northward here. And that's a cell you can see it's gone severe. Uh, they've got a severe thunderstorm warning uh, in effect for that area. And we zoom out a little bit and you see the activity that's a zoom out here and you see still more activity down towards the southwest uh or towards the southeast rather and uh, lots of activity up towards sioux city where they've had a uh they've had a uh, tornado warning earlier on but that has since expired now let's go into the uh, radial velocity here which shows you the winds moving towards the radar site and move winds moving away from it and we zoom out a little bit and let's go back up here towards uh towards sioux city here real quick and where are we? Sioux Falls, not Sioux Falls, Sioux, uh, there we are, Sioux City. And uh, let's put this into motion here. And, well, we're going past it. Well, nevertheless, uh, actually, we can go back. Nevertheless, there has been a, a few th uh, spin ups in the, all the activity out there. And that activity seems to be winding on down. Look at all the moisture there on the water vapor loop here, <laughs> moving in from the south there and creating some very moist atmosphere across the area. And now we've got that disturbance rolling through it, sparking these thunderstorms. I'll come back in a little bit. We'll continue to track these thunderstorms and see if they'll last into tomorrow or into Mother's Day. All right, Chris, we'll check in with you in a few minutes. Meanwhile, law enforcement agencies are now looking for a 22-year-old Iowa man. It's after a shooting killed one person and left another person injured. It happened early this morning in Blair. Here's a picture of the suspect provided by the Blair Police Department. He is identified as Elijah Logan. According to police, when officers arrived on scene about 6.30, they found a man dead. We're told a female victim had gunshot wounds on her legs. Police say Logan was last seen leaving the area in a 1988 green Jeep Cherokee pictured on the right. The Iowa license plate number is NAM032. U.S. Marshals are also working to track down Logan. If you think you've seen him or his vehicle, you're urged to contact 911 immediately. The Omaha Police Department says U.S. Postal inspectors are now seeking information in connection to an armed robbery of a postal carrier. We're told it happened this past January and involved two unknown suspects on the 2500 block of North 25th Street in Omaha. According to the postal inspectors, the suspects stole USPS property, then took off in a car. Specific details regarding what these suspects look like is currently limited. We're told a reward of up to $50,000 is now being offered for information leading to an arrest and conviction. If you have any tips to share, you're encouraged to get those in as soon as you can. As the metro area has continued to grow, the need for skilled tradesmen has as well. Fox 42's Chandler Farnsworth shows us what a local apprenticeship program is doing to fill these much needed positions. Nearly 100 newly trained electricians were celebrated today as they graduated from their apprenticeship program and prepared to move on to bigger and better paying jobs. The training director of the program says though the numbers are good, they would like to increase them by reaching a younger demographic. We're in a huge shortage for, uh, for electricians and uh, you know the city's growing, the, the metro area is growing. To raise awareness around the program, the Omaha Joint Electrical Apprenticeship and Training Committee partnered with the Omaha Public Schools Career Center. Graduate apprentice Ryan Burks is the first to complete the program from the center. He first heard about the opportunity when he was attending Benson High School. Now, he works for a local electricity company, Miller Electric. You get to go to school for free, you get paid while you're going to school, only two nights a week. You only got to pay for your books for tuition. There's no, no tuition at all. I mean, it's, it's one of the best opportunities I ever chose to do. And pay for completing the program may turn some heads. 
Officials with the program tell me that after graduation, graduate students can expect to get high paying positions that average around seventy to one hundred thousand dollars a year. Some of those positions include residential wiremen, inside wiremen and low voltage electrician. Officials with the program encourage students who may be unsure if they want to attend college after high school to give the trades a try. College isn't for everybody and we're hitting, we're, we're able to talk to these high school students and get them involved and see what a career is and, uh, and we're hoping to get that age down. The OPS Career Academies have several pathways that may interest students, such as design and construction, health professions, and urban agriculture. Ryan says he plans on sticking with his current company moving forward. Start ready to start my career. The training director told me today that the program has continued to steadily grow over the years and hopes that trend continues. Signing out for the last time for Fox 42 News, I'm Chandler Farnsworth. The program has graduated a little over a thousand students since its start in 2002. And Omaha's newest concert venue is now officially open for business. Steelhouse Omaha opened tonight to a sold out show and people lining up since the morning. Fox 42's Jessica Salinas takes us there as she explains there was plenty of excitement. Came in line to get, uh, be one of the first people in the steel house. Excited, excited to be here, see the killers, they're fantastic. Will Beard was the 16th person who lined up today to see his favorite band perform. Tracy Carell was also there early to get a good spot. My very first time that I'm getting to see them, I wanted to travel, I was planning on traveling at some point this year, and when they announced an Omaha show, I was like, yes, super excited that I could stay in my city, have people come, and take in a good show. Bringing people into the city is something Omaha Performing Arts wanted to do with the creation of Steelhouse Omaha. Yeah, we're super excited. Uh, Steelhouse is going to attract people, like you said, from all over. We were actually just talking to some fans earlier today. We've got folks from Canada, Colorado, Minnesota, all over the place, and that's just going to help build up downtown and increase that economic impact by an additional $13 million, bringing Omaha Performing Arts' total impact to $61 million. Now the seven-year wait from the design process to the grand opening has people smiling all around. So the emotions are high, you know, it's like, and, and when you see your patrons show up at 5.30 in the morning to start lining up, I mean, it's going to be a big night. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And a memorable one for those ready to see their favorite artist or band. Energy, uh, yeah, Brandon Flowers up on stage. Confetti dropping down, all the songs, yeah. And for those lucky 3,000 ticket holders, the doors will open at 6.30 and the concert will start at 8. Reporting for the last time for Fox 42 News, I'm Jessica Salinas. There'll be a free open house this Sunday. It'll start at 11 in the morning. It ends at 5 in the evening. Coming up, another debt ceiling meeting between President Biden and top congressional lawmakers has been pushed back. Just wait till you hear the warnings one financial sector is now giving. The border is not open. That's the word from President Biden, but critics say the numbers prove otherwise. I'm Scott Thuman in Washington with a look at the latest efforts to come up with new solutions. All right, we are continuing to track severe thunderstorms moving across Nebraska at this hour. We had a tornado watch in effect for a good chunk of the afternoon, but it just expired at the top of the hour about 20 minutes ago. But still, we have severe thunderstorms going on. Let's go track them here on the radar picture. And let's go ahead and take that full screen. You can show some of the, uh, the wet weather, the wild weather across the area, all because of low pressure centered uh, in the center part of the state. There's the center of it right there. And all these storms continue to rotate around them. And notice this big arc of thunderstorms which stops just north of Omaha, and then it starts up again just south of Omaha. Boy, we hit the one little uh, gap in the area here and the, and the thunderstorms, and they happen to be right over Omaha, which is very fortunate for us. Still, to the north of town, some pretty strong storms, and earlier on, we've had some strong storms here now on the west side of town, over towards Boys Town, and uh, Diamond Head in that area there, off towards the, uh, this area, but that is now moving towards the Missouri River up to the north and starting to clear past our area here. So we can... Uh, now, Omaha, so far, looking so good. Now, let's take a look at the radial velocity. And what is uh, significant about this, this shows us the, um, the, the winds moving towards the radar site and the winds moving away from the radar site. And what's significant about that is you can see the spin in some of these areas here, like this right here. Notice this little spin right in there. Let me clear that out now. And 
Notice this is a little spin there. That's the uh, rotation within all this. And when you see a Doppler radar indicated tornado, that's what those fine folks at the Weather Service are looking at. And notice how we have a little bit of green right there. That shouldn't be there because all that wind is moving away from the, uh, the radar site. That little wind is moving towards the radar site because it is slightly rotating. And so that's a little area that could uh, be certainly very carefully monitored for uh, possible tornadic development. Although, again, no warnings are issued right now. But that is certainly something to watch for. Uh, the, the fine folks at the Weather Service will be watching for uh, in time here. All right, temperature-wise, 76 degrees. Boy, look at that dew point, 65 degrees. It is juiced out there. That is very high, so it feels muggy, I'm sure. And uh, that's uh, going to keep things, uh, that, that's the juice, that's the gasoline for all these uh, thunderstorms that we have going on out there. That little disturbance off to the west is the, the spark that's uh, causing all this activity. Okay, so low pressure. Off to the southwest of us right now is a big arc of thunderstorms, which big gap here, and then just a, a break in it right over Omaha. Very fortunate for us. We go forward in time. What's going to happen over the next 24 hours is that low pressure system is going to be scooting off towards the northeast. The thunderstorms, they also scoot off towards the northeast, and it looks like Des Moines and other parts of Iowa is going to be in the mix for the day tomorrow. But as far as we go, we've actually got a dry day coming up for us tomorrow. Then in time for Sunday, Mother's Day, that little disturbance keeps moving off to the east. We may see a little slight chance of a little storm rotating back towards us, but anything we see would just be a, a couple of drops and you'll be able to walk through it and then be done with your day. Looks like pretty quiet stuff as we get into Mother's Day and beyond. All right, let's go take a look at our forecast now for us tonight. Still fun. Thunderstorms out there this evening, probably a couple of hours or so. That threat winds on down and we see a pretty quiet night after that. Still pretty mild night out there, 60 degrees for our overnight low temperature. Tomorrow, those afternoon highs, around 80 degrees, partly cloudy skies, looking dry for our day tomorrow. And then finally, your 10-day forecast, well, that shows that well, temperatures take a big drop. We've got a cold front sweeping on through, and that's going to uh, clean us out here a whole bunch. Temperatures cool on down to the low 70s. We're going to start to warm up a little bit after that. But as far as significant thunderstorms, don't see that in the rest of the 10-day forecast. It's going on right now, but nowhere else in time for us. Back to you, Monty. All right, Chris, thank you. Every year, thousands of women undergo reconstructive surgery after a mastectomy due to breast cancer. But now a battle is brewing over a medical billing code that will change the way insurers reimburse doctors and likely put the procedure out of reach for most women. Here's Spotlight on America's Lisa Fletcher. I have ton, tons of scars from where the implant went in, where they you know, where there was an infection and they had to like clean that up. I can't stand to look at myself in the mirror, honestly. It's just a reminder, a constant reminder. Five years ago, Diane Hager found out she had stage four breast cancer. After a double mastectomy, months of chemotherapy and radiation, and 15 failed reconstruction surgeries, she was left with one option, a procedure called deep flap surgery. If I can't get it, it's gonna be devastating. It's gonna take an emotional toll and I'm gonna need help dealing with that. The procedure uses a woman's own fat and blood vessels to reconstruct the breast. For one in five breast cancer patients, it's the best option. But now, because of a code change in medical billing, the surgery that Diane and so many other women were counting on may be out of reach. My concern is that fewer women are gonna get access to advanced forms of reconstruction. Most of these... Dr. Marisa Weiss is a breast radiation oncologist, the founder of breastcancer.org, and a breast cancer survivor. No one wants mastectomy. No one wants reconstruction. So the reconstruction is their way to get back to feeling more like themselves, and there's really no price you can put on that. But it appears the insurance companies have. Since 2006, doctors have been performing deep flap surgery using a unique billing code. Codes are a standardized language for the healthcare industry to properly bill for services and procedures. But starting next year, the specialized code goes away, and with it, the coverage for most women who need this complicated and expensive surgery that can cost as much as $100,000. And if the codes are dropped and, they, and their payment is substantially reduced, it's unlikely that they're gonna keep doing those procedures. And who suffers from that? It's gonna be the women who want the best outcomes. In advance of next year's billing code change, some insurance companies took the procedure off the menu and were met with pushback from the breast cancer community. 
Cigna, one of the largest health insurers in the U.S., said just days ago that it will delay the policy change and reprocess claims from surgeons so they'll be reimbursed at the rate prior to March 12th when the company suspended the code. Diane Hager says it's a good sign that women's voices are being heard. The insurance company weighed in way more than they should have throughout my entire treatment. The insurance company should not have the power to determine what your treatment or your surgery or what the next step's going to be. In a huge turn of events, we've learned that CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which determines code changes, has announced that for its June 1st meeting, reconsidering the code change will be the number one agenda item. Sources tell us, depending on the outcome, it could mean an extension of the code or a complete reversal. CMS will be accepting written comments up until the meeting. Go to SpotlightInvestigates.com for a link to get you there. For Spotlight on America, I'm Lisa Fletcher. Debt ceiling talks delayed and Wall Street is getting nervous. I'm Atrel Nashar with why the head of one major bank says he's setting up a war room. Weather Window, presented by the National Weather Desk. Shortly before tornadoes rolled through Oklahoma last night, the low-angle sun illuminated these mimatis clouds, which are associated with severe storms. Here's an impressive early morning lightning display in eastern Alabama. Look closely at this cloud formation and you might see two hands forming a heart right in the middle. And here's a perfect rainbow stretching across the sky in Rome, Georgia. For more content like this, follow the National Weather Desk on Twitter. The White House gearing up to mark Infrastructure Week 18 months after President Biden signed the bipartisan infrastructure law. The administration announced more than $220 billion in funding through the law. That includes more than 32,000 projects and awards in all 50 states and territories. White House Infrastructure Implementation Coordinator Mitch Landrieu says the Biden administration is pushing to deliver an infrastructure decade. He says the investments are delivering real results. Uh, next week actually is infrastructure week, uh, but now the difference is we're in full progress. We're breaking ground, we're turning dirt, and we're getting it done. The Biden administration's economic agenda has focused largely on investing in America, but polls suggest many Americans disapprove of President Biden's handling of the economy. A Reuters poll released this week found the president's public approval rating was at 40 percent in recent days, close to the lowest level of his presidency. And there's very little time left for leaders in Washington to reach a deal to raise the debt ceiling and avoid what could be the country's first ever default. Atra El Nashar reports on the warnings from the financial sector about avoiding that outcome and the panic that comes with it. A second debt ceiling meeting between the president and congressional leaders postponed, narrowing the already short timeline to avoid economic catastrophe. An exact X date of default isn't known yet, but the Treasury says it could be as soon as June 1st. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office said Friday there's a significant risk the government runs out of cash in the first two weeks of June. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen reluctant to weigh in on what would happen then. There are potential different paths that could be taken if that doesn't happen, but there is not a single um, thing that can be done that will save the United States from considerable um, economic and financial damage. Yellen says she's set to meet with senior bankers next week when she returns from a G7 finance minister meeting in Japan. I want to understand how they're thinking about the debt ceiling. And what I'm hearing is that it is a grave source of uncertainty that is um, one of the things that businesses are really concerned about. J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon and says he's holding war room meetings every week and he guesses around May 21st they'll be every day talking to clients about how they might get through a potential default. We might get downgraded. The last time we were downgraded, we had like 65 or 70 percent debt to GDP. Now it's 105. Now our deficits are two or three times that that we had back then. So, you know, we better be very careful. Panic, he says, can lead to irrational decisions. I remember even in 08, people were selling certain securities at 40 percent of what they would be worth if we had a Great Depression. At this point, almost all agree the most irrational decision is allowing the country to default in the first place.
On Capitol Hill, I'm Atrel Nishar reporting. We have until June 1st before the U.S. defaults. Republicans and Democrats agree that is not on the table. But former President Trump does not agree. He had this to say at his CNN town hall earlier this week about that possibility. So you know just to be clear, Mr. President, you think the U.S. should default if the White House does not agree to the spending cuts Republicans well, are demanding? Well, you might as well do it now because you'll do it later. There is a lot on the line as Republicans hold out for spending cuts. And many in Trump's party feel his comments are not helpful as they hold off demands for a clean extension. I, I disagree with Donald Trump. Do you want me to say that? I disagree with Donald Trump. He knows better. I disagree. And he, you know, obviously he didn't do it either when he was president. Would be my comeback. No, we're not. We don't want to default. It's not good for the country. Democratic leadership and the president argue Republicans are holding the economy hostage with calls for cuts. President Biden taps Philip Jefferson to serve as vice chair of the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors. Jefferson is currently a member of that board. President Biden also announced he is nominating Dr. Lisa Cook to an additional full term and Adriana Kugler to join the board. If confirmed by the Senate, Kugler would be the first Hispanic American on the Fed's committee. The White House expressing confidence in all of the nominees. These nominees understand that this job is not a partisan one, but one that plays a critical role in pursuing maximum employment, maintaining price stability, and supervising many of our nation's financial institutions. It comes at a critical time for the U.S. economy as inflation levels remain high. Since March of last year, the Fed has raised its benchmark interest rate 10 times to the highest level in 16 years. The Biden administration wants to crack down on carbon emissions from power plants. The Environmental Protection Agency wants to require coal plants to capture 90 percent of their planet warming emissions. Gas plants would have to do the same or run mostly on hydrogen energy by 2038. The EPA says this would cut more than 600 million metric tons of carbon dioxide from the air, preventing 1,300 premature deaths. But Carbon capture and clean hydrogen are not widespread in the power sector. Critics argue the White House just wants to shut down those plants, which would result in job losses. And if you fill up the tank of your vehicle using premium gasoline, AAA data indicates the average price has dropped. In Omaha, that price is now under $3.90. Just last week, it was five cents more expensive. A similar story is also playing out in Council Bluffs. The average price for premium is above $4 right now, but it is five cents cheaper compared to this time a week ago. A new forever stamp has just been released. It honors the life of Ponca Chief Standing Bear. Here's a closer look at it. Today's issue date marks the anniversary of an 1879 landmark court case. It granted Native Americans civil rights under U.S. law. A special ceremony was held in Lincoln earlier today. A descendant of Chief Standing Bear was on hand at that ceremony. According to the U.S. Postal Service, the stamps are available online and through your local post office. The debate over vaccines and natural immunity to COVID-19 hot as ever on Capitol Hill. I'm Kayla Gaskins and coming up we hear from experts and why they argue disregarding natural immunity could have been deadly. Three years into the COVID-19 pandemic and debate over vaccines and natural immunity still causing division between Democrats and Republicans as they analyze the nation's pandemic response. Kayla Gaskin joins us from Capitol Hill. Medical experts testifying before Congress Thursday. Let's not ignore this mountain of evidence. As the House Oversight Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic dug into why health leaders dismissed natural immunity as a legitimate defense. The early data clearly showed that natural immunity was strong. Treating vaccines as the only way to fight COVID-19. I think we all agree that early on, no one knew exactly what. So we were all clamoring for, for a vaccine, but at the same time, uh, should have been looking at natural immunity. Sounds like the narrative being pushed is to get infected with COVID-19. And if you get infected, then you don't need a vaccine. Dr. Macri, a GOP witness, says Democrats and the experts siding with them are missing the point. 
I don't like the conversation framed around all or nothing, entirely relying on natural immunity. Doctors custom tailor treatments all the time. This all or nothing cult around vaccine. The GOP witnesses say this approach caused real harm. It also caused needless loss of life as vaccines were given to essential workers with natural immunity instead of being prioritized for the elderly. Democrats on the committee say pandemic leaders did the best they could with what they had. To assign blame uh, when we were all trying to figure this out together, I think is absolutely the wrong way to go. Meanwhile, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a new law this week, permanently banning businesses and government entities from requiring COVID-19 vaccination or discriminating against unvaccinated employees. These mandates, the purpose of them was not to safeguard your health. The purpose of them was to control your behavior. Democrats worry this current investigation will increase vaccine hesitancy, while Republicans say it's crucial to understand what happened so lawmakers can do better in the future. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins. Well, we continue to track severe weather here around Omaha and the rest of Nebraska now starting to move into Iowa as the threat from severe weather does seem to be shifting from Nebraska into Iowa here uh, a little after 930. Let's take a look at the radar picture and you can see the line of thunderstorms moving through Nebraska now sliding into South Dakota and into uh, Iowa at this hour as well. Uh, it's all been focused. All this moisture in place has felt muggy and humid around the area here for a while, hasn't it? Uh, now the little uh, disturbance rolling through all of it is sparking these showers and thunderstorms and they seem to be crossing into uh, in, into Iowa, into Iowa here and getting out of our region. And so that means calmer times ahead for us. Notice there around Omaha, just a little gap. There has been activity uh, all around us here, but in town itself, uh, it's been kind of a little gap here and we've been spared with the worst of the severe weather all the way down to almost uh, Nebraska City. Uh, as far as what's going on at the moment, uh, some activity up to the north of us, you see towards the uh, Missouri Valley and, uh, and down to the south of us, obviously, as well. Taking a look at the radial velocity, you can see uh, that we've, uh, well, we've still a little bit of spin in the air there, not enough to generate a, uh, a tornado warning or anything like that. But if you look at carefully at this little area right here in the radial velocity, notice a little spins going on in there. That is uh, what meteorologists at the National Weather Service will look at very carefully. And if they determine that it's spinning a little too much, that would be a Doppler radar indicated tornado and uh, they would issue a warning on that. But nothing going on right now. The tornado watch, which had been in effect for, uh, for most of the day here, that has expired about a half hour ago. And it looks like the, the main threat is going to be a few uh, thunderstorms now moving into Iowa. And it looks like Nebraska is really starting to clear out now. Temperature is 76 at Epley. Uh, dew point still juiced 65 degrees. So it's a lot of moisture in the air right about now. Broad picture again showing all these thunderstorms to the north. All these thunderstorms to the south, right around Omaha, nothing. That's great. There was some activity on the west side of town towards Diamond Head, that area, but that is also pushed off to the northeast. Uh, now in the next 24 hours, we take a look all the way in time through Saturday evening. That little disturbance moves right over Sioux City, and that means the severe weather out of it is going to be arcing over into Iowa. And across our area, we have a pretty quiet day coming tomorrow. And further in time towards Sunday, Mother's Day, uh, maybe a few little showers try to rotate into our area, but not much. And certainly doesn't look like any severe weather. Looks like the worst of it, again, pushing off to the east. Tonight's forecast, well, uh, still some thunderstorms out there, but that activity is starting to wind on down and starting to move into Iowa. Tomorrow, partly cloudy, dry and temperatures still comfortable around 80 degrees. Your 10 day forecast showing that the beginning of it showing temperatures dropping a whole lot here for mom on Mother's Day as a cool front slides on through and then we start to warm it up a little bit as we get deeper into next week. Monty. Chris, the Savannah Bananas baseball team bringing in a new meaning to baseball. Just wait till you hear the story of one player who is an inspiration to his fans. Friday Favorites is sponsored by Valley Bet. With our partners at Valley Bet, it's time for your Friday Favorites. After falling behind 3-2 in the series, the Celtics were able to secure an away victory to force a Game 7 this Sunday on their home court. Boston held a pretty comfortable lead for all of Game 6 until the end of the third quarter when the Sixers tied the game up. Tatum came alive in the fourth quarter to secure the Celtics' victory and bring it back to Boston for Game 7. An undefeated ace, Shane McClanahan, will put his 7-0 record on the line this weekend when he faces off against Nestor Cortez and the Yankees. The Rays are leading the MLB standings this year with just nine losses on the season. 
The Yankees are struggling to get traction early this season, sitting in last place in the AL East. We'll see you after the weekend for your Monday misses. Friday Favorites is sponsored by Valley Bet. Online gaming is legal in Iowa. Tom Brady will be at the home opener for the New England Patriots on Sunday, September 10th, but not as a player. Robert Kraft, the owner of the Patriots, says Brady will be honored during lifetime, during halftime rather, of the team's first home game of the season against the Philadelphia Eagles. Brady led the Patriots to six Super Bowl wins and 17 division titles. The star quarterback left the Patriots in 2019 and went on to play for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers before announcing his retirement back in February. And they're being called the Harlem Globetrotters of baseball. A Connecticut player is living out his field of dreams by playing with the Savannah Bananas. Mark Sudal reports. The Savannah Bananas play a different brand of baseball. The popular traveling minor league team is like the game's version of the Harlem Globetrotters. It's all about the entertainment. beginning was a little bit out of my comfort zone with the, the dancing and all the antics, but I've come to love it and, and I've honestly been improving my dance moves. So One of their players is so Vinny DeRubius from Trumbull. Two birds. It's like a dream. Um, it, it feels as though I, I'm a big leaguer. DeRubius almost lost his dream on an inside pitch in college. And it had fouled off my the end of my bat and just kind of skipped right off my bat and hit me square, square in the eye. Derubius was rushed to the hospital where he had reconstructive eye surgery. He lost sight in his left eye, but he didn't let it cloud his dreams. As soon as I was released from the hospital, I was told not to do a thing, but um, I went directly to the batting cage. I called up my hitting coach. I said, meet me at the batting cage. Come on in here, Mom. <laughs> now in his first few months with the Bananas, he's helping fans with hardships one pitch at a time. These kids obviously look up to you. What is that like? It, it's one of the most fulfilling feelings I could uh, I could ever imagine in this life. Derubius has had plenty of time to reflect on his journey. He's found a new home with his new team. If you have a passion for something, if you work at it and you have belief in yourself and you love that enough, that you can you can do it. You know what I mean? And that's kind of the message that I'm starting to try and spread. A message that seems to be connecting with everyone. We're learning more about the events that will take place leading up to the College World Series this year. Team practices at Charles Schwab Field will begin at 9 in the morning on Thursday, June 15th. According to CWS of Omaha, those will go until 5 in the evening. There will also be a fan fest between the hours of 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. Public parking is available for open practice day in the Charles Schwab Field, CHI Health Center surface lots. The College World Series begins this year on June 16th. It will run through either June 25th or June 26th. They say that all good things must come to an end. Stay tuned. My final Beggars Beat on the Fox 42 News at 9 is coming up next. I was a 19-year-old mass communications student at UNO when I walked into the university's radio station, KVNO, for the very first time. It was a magical moment where I felt like the doors of heaven had opened up and showed me the rest of my life. You see, as a kid, I always wanted to be on radio or TV, but my parents, school counselors, and pretty much everyone else told me what a tough business broadcasting is, especially with a voice and a face like this. Numerous times I was told to give it up and go to my plan B. But I never had a plan B. Being a broadcaster was all I ever wanted to do. And through all the highs and the lows, for almost 50 years, I was able to make that happen. I've seen a lot of change in communications over those years. I started as a disc jockey, playing vinyl records on AM radio. Now the music comes off a computer via satellite. 
Back then, there was no such thing as talk radio, cable TV, streaming services, or websites. And over the years, I was able to adapt to those changes. And it looks like I'm going to have to adapt one more time. You see, tonight is my last Becca's Beat here on Fox 42. The company that owns this station has decided to go a different direction with its news operation. I want to thank Jeff Miller and Franco Gentili, the two general managers who supported me here. I also want to thank my coworkers, but most of all, I want to thank you, the viewers and the radio listeners who've been a part of this incredible journey. Will I pop up on some other media outlet here in town? Who knows what the future holds? But if this is the end, I don't regret a minute of it. I've achieved more than I or anyone thought was possible back when I first started. If you'd like to keep in touch, you can follow me on social media or here's my email address. But I'm not going to retire. You see, three years ago, I finally got a plan B. I've been helping people buy and sell their homes with Better Homes and Gardens, Real Estate, The Good Life Group. But for now, it's about broadcasting. And I want to thank you. I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank you for everything. And if you're just starting out on your journey, always follow your dreams and don't be afraid to adapt to the changes. It may not be easy, but in the end, you'll never regret it. Till our paths cross again, be well, be kind to one another, and bye, y'all. And as you just heard, this will be our last newscast as part of the Fox 42 KPTM News at 9. We want to thank you for your trust and for letting us be your source for news and information these past, at least for me, 10 years, more years than that, I think. Very grateful for that. It's been an honor and a privilege to serve you in that way. So now, for one last time, from all of us here at Fox 42 KPTM News, thanks for watching. Good night and God bless.